Good afternoon, and thank you for joining the FIC and the AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships live chat series. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome, and if you participated in previous chats in this series, welcome back. My name is Salaha Sharif, and I am the Director of Outreach and Recruitment for the AAAS s and Policy Fellowships, and I will be moderating today's chat. So during the open application cycle for the 2018-19 S&T Policy Fellowship year, we are hosting a series of live chats. Each chat has a specific theme and is an opportunity for you to hear from and connect with fellows of varied discipline backgrounds and career stages. The theme for today's chat is the application and interview. And joining us today, we have two fellows who will be answering your questions about their fellowship experience, how to approach your application, and what to expect during the interview. You can submit a question at any time by clicking in the question box and then typing in your question there. As a AAAS s and Policy Fellow, you are spending a year in an immersive policy experience in one of the three branches of the federal government. As a Policy Fellow, you are taking your discipline and area of expertise and applying it broadly to policy. The fellowship is not a research or postdoc experience. But what it is, is a professional development opportunity for you to bring STEM expertise to policy and gain a stronger understanding of how policy affects science, as well as develop an extensive network. Fellows in this program rep represent a broad array of range of career stages, as you can apply at any point in your career. And they also dem um, represent diverse disciplinary backgrounds, which include sciences, social sciences, health, medical, and engineering backgrounds. AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowships are offered in all three branches of the federal government. The executive branch fellowships are federal agency placements, and we award approximately 150 executive branch placements each year. Legislative branch fellowships are in congressional offices or on House or Senate committees. AAAS sponsors two legislative branches fellows each year. The Judicial Fellowship is at the Federal Judicial Center, and we award one Judicial Fellowship each year. Applicants can and should consider applying to more than one fellowship area. You can learn more about each fellowship area, including potential host offices, by clicking the Become a Fellows link on the fellowship's website. Applications are currently being accepted for the 2018-19 fellowship year, and the deadline to apply is November 1st, 2017. The fellowship year begins September 1st and runs through August 31st. This is a full-time commitment, and all host office placements are based in Washington, D.C. Eligibility requirements include holding U.S. citizenship and completion of a doctoral degree in science or engineering. Applicants with a master's in engineering and three years of professional engineering experience are also eligible to apply to the program. For the Judicial Fellowship, applicants must also have at least three years of post-degree professional experience. Visit the Fellowship's website for complete details about the program areas, eligibility, and the application process. Now I'd like to introduce the two fellows joining us today. Ashley Hutterson is an alumna of the fellowship program. She was a 2015-17 AAAS s and Policy Fellow at the National Science Foundation in the Engineering Education and Centers Division. As a fellow, she provided leadership on developing, coordinating, and implementing support for programs that foster an inclusive climate for pre-collegiate and collegiate STEM students. Following her fellowship, she accepted a position with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers as the manager of engineering education. In this role, she's responsible for advancing and managing the research, development, promotion, implementation, and assessment of products and services that will help colleges of engineering develop their curricula and their faculty. Ashley holds a PhD in chemistry. The second fellow joining us on today's chat is a current s and Policy Fellow. Peter Wyckoff is an Executive Branch Fellow at the Department of Energy in the Office of Biological and Environmental Research. Peter was also a 2016-17 AAAS s and Policy Fellow in the Legislative Branch in the Office of Senator Al Franken. 
As a congressional fellow, he staffed the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee as a member of Senator Franken's office. In this role, he attended meetings of the Senate Climate Change Clearinghouse and worked more broadly on the Senator's legislative agenda in energy, environment, and agriculture. Peter is currently on leave as a professor at the University of Minnesota, Morris. As a liberal arts college professor, he teaches, reads, and publishes broadly on a large variety of environmental and ecological topics, but with a heavy emphasis on climate change, biofuels, agriculture, and the carbon cycle. Peter holds a PhD in forest ecology. Peter and Ashley, thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. So Ashley and Peter are here to answer your questions and share the fellowship experience, policy insight, and career impact. And as a reminder, to click the question box to submit your question. And please keep your questions short and directed to a particular individual or the panel as a whole. And we will try to get to as many questions as possible today. So I'd like to begin by starting us all off um, with a question. Um, and that question is that, Peter and Ashley, you both applied to the fellowship at different points in, in your career. So what I'd like to know is what interest, what prompted your interest in science policy, and specifically what prompted you to apply to the AAAS s and policy um, fellowships? So Ashley, why don't we have you go first? Thank you. Um, so for me, my interest in science policy started when I was in grad school. Once I finished my qualifying exams, um, I started to look for opportunities or areas of interest related to science that had a broader perspective. So I wanted to see where my work at the bench, where it had an impact um, at a larger scale. So I decided to apply for the fellowship the um, s and Policy Fellowship, because I felt that I wanted something that um, was historic, that was known to really take scientists and engineers who were in the position that I was in and help to just motivate and cultivate their interests so that they can do a deeper dive into policy, better understand what science policy means, um, and to just help me to really hone my interest in policy. And then Peter? Yeah, so I was a actual undergraduate in political science, and uh, I wanted to be an environmental lawyer, so I started taking some science classes, and things got out of hand. Um, <laughs> and I ended up going to a graduate school in forest ecology. Um, I went down the academic path uh, and ended up at the University of Minnesota Morris, which is the liberal arts campus of the University of Minnesota. Um, went through tenure, had my first leave, uh, went to the University of Washington in Seattle, other, other Washington, uh, for a research, you know, uh, experience working with a colleague out there on my last leave. Now, now a full professor, another leave came up and uh, thought I'd do something, something new. Um, but the policy side was always an interest of mine, so. Um, I'm here for uh, two years on a two-year leave, a, a sabbatical and then a leave for those who are in the system. Um, and so is my wife, who's also a fellow, so. Great. I, did not, I did not know that your wife was also. Now she's at the National Science Foundation. Oh, nice. So I, um, I'd like to kind of dive into some of the um, advanced questions that we received. Um, and one of them was related to sort of the fellowship experience. So could you both talk about how you decided which projects to work on during your fellowship, how that sort of process works? And then the second part of this question is, did you have the freedom to affect change in the sectors that you are in? So Ashley, why don't we have you start with that? So how did you decide um, at NSF what projects you would be um, working on during your fellowship year? So um, I was fortunate. I had a mentor who was extremely, uh, well, not say fortunate, but I had a mentor who was eager and excited about my interest and helping me, again, to polish that interest. And so I was able to dibble and dabble until I found what I was really genuinely interested in. Um, I had my center focus of work, so I worked in broad participation in engineering, um, so initiatives around diversity and inclusion. But there, once you open that door, there are several other doors, and I really wanted to figure out which one I wanted to work with, whether it was the K-12, was I interested in undergrad, faculty, all these aspects about diversifying the STEM field that I was aware of, but not 
um, in detail. And so for me, being at the Science Foundation, I was able to surround myself with people that were also interested in diversity and inclusion at different levels, work with them, and see where my interest lies. Was it something that I wanted to do full time? Was it something I wanted to volunteer my time and do? Um, so for me, that was a driving factor in where my interests were. In addition, with my mentor, I was also able to really sit down and say, what do I like, what do I don't like? And we tried to find things outside of my initial primary project that allowed me to explore those interests to see if there was something, again, that I wanted to do on a day-to-day -day basis, or I wanted to just do externally. Um, how did I want to incorporate that into my portfolio regarding diversity and inclusion? And the second part of your question would be more time to uh, so did you have the freedom, freedom to affect change? Um, oh, yes, so um, I was able to, uh, I was like a kid in a candy store at the Science Foundation. I was able to just, if there was something of interest, um, I was pulled along and after my first year my work pretty much spoke for itself. So people were willing to give me um, projects or pull me in on teams and give me my own piece of that puzzle to really carve out. And a lot of the initiatives, I was able to work on initiatives. Um, one of them is NSF Includes, which is a major initiative for diversity and inclusion. I was able to work with that from the ground up. And so those type of things, um, especially from a funding perspective, helped to shape science, which, again, tied in with the policy and just really kept me interested and engaged and prepared me for what I'm doing now. So Peter, you have experience both as a legislative branch fellow, which you did last year, and in this year as an executive branch. So how did you work, or in, given your legislative branch experience, how did you um, work on projects there? Now in your current role as executive branch fellow, how does that work? So uh, last year I was a congressional fellow, and I was one of the two congressional fellows from AAAS. But AAAS also administers uh, congressional fellowship programs for a bunch of different professional societies. So I think there were about 30, 35 of us last year. Um, and you get here, you go through AAAS training, but you don't know what you're going to do yet. And then you basically have to go find yourself a job on the Hill. Um, and it's easier than it sounds because you're coming as a free worker. Um, and uh, AAAS does organize, uh, there's a big list of, of people who are looking for somebody and it's much bigger than the, the number of uh, <laughs> fellows there are. So I thought about it a bit and said I want to be in the Senate. Um, I, because of what I work on, I wanted to, uh, from a, as a scientist, I wanted to either work for somebody who was on the Senate um, Environment and Public Works Committee or the Senate, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and I ended up in the office of someone who are, is on the Senate and Nat Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, Senator Franken was a, a, a logical fit. I'm from Minnesota. I've been a University of Minnesota professor for almost two decades. Uh, I'm working in the environment space. You know, Healthcare policy is somewhat healthcare policy, same sort of things wherever you are, but environmental issues really change with place. So the fact I knew a lot about uh, Minnesota and its particular environmental challenges, uh, I think was very helpful. Though not necessary, I think I was maybe the only person in the whole pool that was working for someone from their own state. So it just worked out well for me. And then could you also speak about your executive branch um, experience? I know it's very new here all the in here. I think it's like the first or second week here, but at the DOE, do you have a sense of how you're going to sort of tackle the various um, projects? How does that process work? So I've been there a grand total of two weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I've gone from an office that had other scientists in it. Uh, that's just a weird thing about the, the Franken office. Um, to an office where everybody else has a PhD in, you know, a field similar to what I have a PhD in. So it's a, it's a very different environment. We're a funding agency, so what I'll be working with is helping to guide. I want to have a grant portfolio, but helping to, to work on projects that will help them make decisions about how to allocate whatever funding they have. Um, you know, it's. It feels like coming home a little bit, having been in the very foreign environment of the Senate, 
this is an area where I've, I've received a research grant from the, uh, from the office I'm working in before. So, uh, and I'm looking at, you know, the projects that are funded by my office and it's all stuff that I know the science. Um, not all of it, but a lot of it is. So in some ways it's a, it's a lot less out of my academic comfort zone than uh, being in a Senate office was. So one of the uh, live questions that we have is uh, the questioner asks, it has a particular interest in um, working, um, being placed either at the National Science Foundation or the Department of Energy. Um, so the question is about how does that process work in terms of deciding where they're going to be placed? And do, would you recommend that they mention that they want to be placed at the NSF or at the DOE in their application or during their interview? So what advice would you um, both give? So um, I wouldn't say specifically where you want to be placed um, in the application process. Um, I would let that organically come out later on when you are asked where are your interests. I think you can describe your interests um, without necessarily specifying a place because a lot of times people come in thinking that only certain agencies do certain things. And once you find out that other agencies have the same component, there may be a place for you there. So I think explaining your interests and tying in that story of what you bring and why you have this interest um, at the initial stage is beneficial. In terms of trying to decide, um, it's a matching process. So you interview with NSF, you interview with offices at NSF that have openings, you interview with offices at DOE that have openings openings and it's a matching process. So that office would say that they would rank the applicants and you rank your um, interests as well. And AAAS has a very intricate, super secret way of deciding who matches with whom. So you sometimes you have an option where you may get several offers. Sometimes you may get one or two. So that comes down to the relationship. I think going in with a, with a set place can be a little bit of a hindrance because one thing I've learned about science policy is that it is a very, um, there's a lot of opportunity. And there are opportunities in places that coming from the bench, you may not have typically known were there. Yeah, I would, I, I would follow up on that and agree with everything Ashley said. Um, you don't want to say, I want to come to Washington to do a specific project because you have no idea whether that project is going to be, you know, something that's available to fellows or, you know, whether you would get picked. But it doesn't matter in some ways where you go. I think that you will learn a lot, even if it's an area that is not, uh, you know, something where you feel like you have the, the direct scientific training for that area. Um, I think you'll find you do have a lot of skills that are useful um, wherever you end up, just as a PhD scientist. Um, so I would be, I would show that you've done a little poking and know the sorts of things the government does. So maybe mention some broad areas or agencies you'd be interested in working in, but I wouldn't get very specific because it's not something you're going to be able to control. You know, great advice from both of you, exactly. It's really kind of being broad. Have a demonstrate that you have an understanding and an interest, but don't get too um, specific with regards to agency placement. Because something to keep in mind is that when you are initially applying, your application is being reviewed by alumni of the fellowship program, as well as a selection committee. They are not looking for to place you in a specific host office at that point. That comes later on during the interview um, and selection process as Ashley had mentioned um, towards the end when we when you do the interviews with the host offices and then we have that ranking um, system. So Ashley, this is actually a question came in for you and this is specific to I think that you had alluded to a mentor. So the question is from Shahab and he's asking um, that you spoke about your mentor. Is this a mentor that was assigned to you after you received the fellowship? Yes, so um, when you're placed in an office, you are given a mentor. Um, and we all know well, there's a difference between a mentor, an advisor, and someone who's kind of champion for you. Um, and they can be the same person or they can be different people. Um, my mentor, who was also responsible for my paperwork in terms of signing off on certain things, was also a career mentor in helping to guide me in and outside of NSF. So 
um, that relationship happened organically. But the term mentor is used throughout the AAAS fellowship when you are assigned to a person at the agency. It's almost, instead of saying your boss, because that kind of has a certain connotation, we use the word mentor because it is a professional development um, fellowship. Exactly. So every fellow in their host office has a supervisor um, as well um, as a mentor to help guide them through their um, fellowship year. So I want to transition. Oh, sorry, Peter, do you want to add something? Yeah, if you're, if you're in Congress, the boss is whoever the elected official is you work for. Um, but you will have a mentor, and they will probably be younger than you if you're someone like me. And <laughs> that works out fine. <laughs> So this next question is from Marina, and she's asking about the interview process. So she says, what types of questions are asked during the interview, and then what recommendations do you have to or things to do or not to do to be successful during the selection interview? So Ashley, Peter, who wants to take that one first? Go ahead. I can, oh, go first. Yeah. Um, so the types of questions, um, I found that the interview process, the so once you put your application and then you have that initial interview, it was really to see, um, to get a gauge for your personality, your feel, your excitement, and your interest. Make sure you're not a robot, per se, and really just get to see you face to face. Um, I got questions about um, my bench research, my interest, um, how would I transition into this field from going to the bench, because there are certain aspects of these different careers that um, people sometimes people aren't aware of. So in terms of preparing for the interview, I would I would know and understand your story. So why are you actually doing this? Is it just something to do or is it something that you're really passionate and interested and interested about? Have you done your research on why you picked the AAAS fellowship versus another fellowship? Do you have a general understanding of what you could potentially be getting into in terms of policy and how you'll be working? Um, using your science background to really implement and affect uh, science policy, STEM policy in, in, in the US and, and potentially the world, depending on where you're working. Um, I also think reaching out to Alumni fellows, um, I think it's really helpful to get an idea of what they've done. There's information all over the internet about people, and if you just type in fellows, you can find a huge list of um, alumni fellows and where they are, where they were. I think that's helpful to in, in putting in drawing connections and connecting the dots for your interview. Great. And then Peter? Um, for the interview, I think they're <laughs> Don't, they know you're a decent scientist. You don't have to prove that. I think what you're trying to show is that you can communicate, and you can communicate in a way that is clear and hopefully would be clear to non-scientists. So I think uh, don't go in saying, I'm going to show how strong a scientist I am and how technically strong I am. Go in and say, I am here to explain things to people. Great. In an enthusiastic way. <laughs> I think you guys both have hit it on the nail here is like know your story and be able to communicate it well. So this next question relates to who the application sort of what to highlight. So the question is, what professional academic experiences would you recommend to highlight on your application to make it more competitive uh, and, or types of qualities that an applicant should highlight? Um, and can you provide some examples of leadership positions or other involvement in academia or outside of academia that would strengthen an application? Mm -hmm. That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's, right. it's multi-part. So, Ashley, do you want to take that one first? I'm going to let Peter go first. Okay. <laughs> so, I was in a different position than, I mean, there's, there are a lot of mid-career fellows, but the bulk of the program are people who are quite a bit younger. They, they're usually coming out of a postdoc. Um, I don't know what the median, median experience is. But um, what I emphasized as, as a mid-career academic is that I have been a liberal arts college teacher and I have been practicing science communication as my job. Um, you know, I've also been involved in leadership roles in my university. I don't know how much that matters to uh, to, to the criteria they're looking for, but I emphasize that. And I have been involved in um, local politics. Um, that doesn't help you, I don't think, for a, 
executive branch fellow, but I think it, it might be good to say I know something about the political system um, if you're going to Congress. So, so what advice would you give to someone in terms of what to highlight either professionally or just other leadership? So I came fresh out of a postdoc and for me I was a little, I, I wondered if I had those skills that we talk about that they may have been looking for because such a competitive fellowship. So for my application I highlighted, um, let me backtrack, my general, my, my sincere interest in policy for, um, allowed me to be in situations, experiences, leadership positions, committees that all centered around that uh, interest. So I didn't have to really carve out or, or make up a, a story. So I was able to share that, you know, I'm really interested in helping people and in, in getting minorities involved in STEM research. So I am the co-chair of a committee that helps K-12 go in every Saturday and do X, Y, and Z. So I think your interest will drive you, whether it's on a national scale or a local scale, to be involved. And talking about those interests allows the committee to see that whether you are in a prestigious position or you are in a non-prestigious position, you are still going to be committed to this interest. And I think one of the things you need to also ask yourself, if you don't get the fellowship, how would you continue on your path for policy? Because that is very important in, again, getting people that are sincere about this and don't just, you know, oh, I was bored at the bench and then I'm going to come. But that's not where the, the push is. So I think just discussing what you do that got you excited and how you maintain or sustain that interest locally where you are will stand out to the committee that you are committed to this. It's not just a fluke or something, just something to do. It's something that you're sincere about. Great advice. So this next question is from Mike, and I think it's a great question. So he's asking us, what's been your favorite experience so far um, in the fellowship? Uh, so maybe Peter, we'll start with you, and um, perhaps you can speak to the legislative um, experience. And a year from now, you can kind of chime in with the executive um, experience. But what would you say has been your, what was your favorite experience as a legislative branch fellow? Well, I worked for Al Franken, which is kind of <laughs> working for Al Franken is just like you would expect it to be. So it was a constant environment of humor, dark humor after the election, but. Uh, um, we felt like we were doing important work, and it's an office that works as a team, and everybody is definitely pulling for Team Franken, and it was just great to be, especially in this year, I think that the office became more prominent than it otherwise would, uh, in an environment where we felt like we were, we were doing important stuff. Then Ashley, what about you? What was your favorite experience at the National Science Foundation? Back to um, the first one, uh, I got to go on the Hill, which was really, I mean, you hear about D.C. and everyone's so important and busy, but I got to go on the Hill and understand about that culture, sitting on briefings, things that I would not have known I could have done if I had not been in the Fellowship at the Science Foundation. Um, and the other part for me is, is more of a, the professional development side. Um, I was a confident scientist, but being in the fellowship really pushed it over the edge for me, which is what I needed. It gave me the push to stand up in front of a group of my peers or um, senior leadership and be able to express my thoughts and my interests and feel confident about that, not question whether or not I belong here or if this is something that I'm good at. Um, I have a PhD, but you know, it, it, sometimes you have doubts that come in, and the fellowship for me allowed me to minimize those doubts and really shine as a scientist and kind of live up to that potential that everyone around me knew that I had. But sometimes you just you wonder, like coming fresh out of a postdoc, there are doubts about the science and the work that you're doing. And so the fellowship for me really just polished that diamond, that interest about um, and solidified my career of going into science policy. Okay. So this next question um, is from Amy, and she's asking how to approach applying to 
the um, different program areas. So an applicant can apply to up to three of our fellowship program areas, the executive branch, the legislative, as well as the judicial. So um, I think this would be a great question actually for you, Peter, since you applied to two um, program areas and were selected as a fellow for, um, for both. So how, how do you cater your experience to the different program areas? And how different were your personal statements or the candidate statement of interest for each of the two program areas to which you apply? Um, I'm going to confess that I plagiarized one statement in writing the other one very heavily. So um, maybe I shouldn't say that. But uh, there was a lot of pros in both statements that were exactly the same. But I did acknowledge that I understood what the legislative branch did and where I would fit in versus what agencies do. So. It was, uh, you know, a different framing of basically the same material. Great. And it's something to keep in mind for those of you that are applying to, to two of the program areas, and you should definitely consider doing that, is you do want to tailor your prompt STEM application to each of the program areas because the policy experience is different in the executive versus the legislative, and you want to be able to demonstrate in your application that you have an understanding of that. So this next question, I guess, um, is from Marina, and it's kind of opposite of what Mike asked earlier. So well, the question is, what aspects of the fellowship did you enjoy the least? Um, Peter, go first. <laughs> um, I really had a great experience, so I know that's a cop-out. Um, I think the, just like any job search, the tension of uh, not knowing if you're going to get the fellowship and not knowing uh, where you're going to place once you do, I mean, that's stressful. Um, but once I, I got there, it was great. I was on the Hill. I was working, obviously, for one side. The side did very poorly in the election. And uh, that was uh, uh, something that was sort of <laughs> kind of knocked the wind out of the office. And, and it was, you know, I was part of that. I mean, um, and took a while to get back on get back on our feet. So So I would say for me, being at the National Science Foundation, um, it the pace was a little different than being at the bench and in the lab. I, I, I don't want to say slower, because it's not a nice word, but it was different. Um, and I had to adjust to that pace. So coming from the bench where you're you know I, I was doing protein assays, westerns, all these techniques, and then I come and I'm writing a memo or a brief or I'm doing research to just talk about a topic was something I had to adjust to. And the time span between starting and actually diving into a project, it took a couple of months. And that was an adjusting period for me, but I needed those months to get acclimated to the environment. I did what we call informational interviews where I reached out to people to learn um, because I was changing fields. I was coming from uh, more of a health disparities, biochemistry background, going into basically education. There was a lot of things I needed to read about and learn so that I could go into a room and have a conversation and know what I'm talking about and be up to date on the current literature around diversity issues facing minorities, marginalized groups, women. Um, so the, the, the months that I felt were kind of slow were actually me doing the prep work to jump into the project. So I think the least, the part that I liked the least was understanding that that's what it was. Because it took me a couple of weeks to understand, you should be reading, you should be following things, you should be going to events, you should be um, joining the conversation around DC about what you're interested in. Yeah, can I amend my answer? Um, the biggest shock to the system as an academic was how time sensitive things are. And there's a lot of pressure to answer things very quickly and not be wrong. Um, and you're not going to have the time that you think you need. So you need to be able to say, given this constraint, this is the best answer I can give you. Um, and admit what you're not sure about. But I remember the first day I was there, I was asked, hey, we, we're putting together this memo. Can you uh, throw together a background paragraph about X? And I started looking up papers. And then it became very clear to me after about 15 minutes, oh, they wanted it already. So it wasn't going to be a, <laughs> a, a deep dive into the primary literature. Um, it was, as I learned later, it was going to be 
pick up the phone and call the experts at Congressional Research Service or at some place you trust or call. Yeah, a lot of quickly finding answers and less deep dive time for deep dives into, into every topic. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, so this next question actually um, is from Shahab and it's for you, Peter. Um, so the question is with the experience that you've gained, what do you think you can do better? How do you think it will make you a better um, faculty um, once you um, go back to academia? Um, so I teach in a biology program and you know, I'm an environmental scientist. So a lot of science has, if you think about it, a policy end to it. There's some reason you're doing the research and it's usually to, you know, at least in the social science and maybe the environmental sciences, maybe not so much the basic scientists, but you're uh, trying to uh, affect a, a social societal debate, provide more information to that debate. Um, what I have seen now is further down the pipeline as it gets filtered and I can bring that back to my students. I also teach in an environmental um, studies program and there we explicitly uh, teach about the role of science and policy, and now I just know a whole lot more. So I think I'll be a, a more useful person in the classroom for that reason. So this next question um, is from Margaret, and her question is asking if the fellowship is appropriate for those that are coming straight out of a graduate um, program. Um, and I guess I'll reframe this a little bit. So what advice would you give to those who are coming out of their PhD or, or out of a postdoc? Um, and for those of you that are on this um, presentation, keep in mind that a good number of our fellows each year are about zero to five years out of their PhD program. So while you can apply at any point in your career, a large percentage of our fellows are early career. But with that, um, I, um, Peter and Ashley, I'd be interested to kind of hear what advice would you give to somebody who perhaps feels that they don't, they have a lot of academic experience, but perhaps not as much of experience outside of academia. So how should they go about making their application more competitive? So I'm, I'm hearing two kind of questions and I'll tap on both of them. So I think coming straight out of the, the graduate program, um, I'm kind of old fashioned and I think you should do a postdoc. If you can carve that out the way that you want, but I think the postdoc is, and it's, it, that's not a, a, a favorable stance. People have their views on postdocs, but I do think they help with the, the PhD process. Um, with that being said, I do have colleagues who came straight from their graduate program, and uh, again, it's all about that story and that interest. They knew that they were interested in STEM policy work, so where they were, they went about implementing and affecting change in, every, in, in the ways that they could be involved. So whether it was starting something local, joining a chapter that was doing something, volunteering, and because of that interest, it was able to um, come through on the application and their story is just tied together. So the story that you tell about how you decide to go and get a PhD and now come into the policy is important. And those little spaces, tying those two together, I think is really what helps people to stand out, showing that you understand how it led to this. But I do think the postdoc is important. Some people may not like that response, um, but I do think it, it's, it's important. Um, and even if it's just a year, I think it, it helps with your scientific interest in your career. Um, I knew I wanted to go into STEM policy before I did my postdoc, but my postdoc experience was um, critical, and I think it's also one of the reasons that I was able to be competitive for the fellowship, honestly. It gave me another level of experience that added to my application and strengthened my application. Yeah, I would emphasize, and obviously I came in mid-career, but I came out of academia. It's a lot different than what I'm doing here. So, um, you know, nothing about being a scientist gives you much direct experience that's <laughs> of what life is like on the Hill. So if you're fresh out of grad school or a middle-aged professor, you've had about the same amount of directly, I've done that before. And I think that fellowship is meant to be an entry point for scientists who want to get involved in policy. So not having a lot of policy experience, I don't know that that's a bad thing. Right, no. This next question is from Amy, and her question is, how specific were you in your interest into this 
how specific were your interests into specific areas of policy in the application process? So I think what she's asking is how how do you sort of define in terms of your well still being broad, but also wanting to indicate sort of your specific areas of policy interest? So what advice would you give to someone as they approach their application? So again, I don't think you need to go down to the the deepest core about the type of policy you want to do because um, one thing I've learned about science policy is that it's ever changing and you have to be able to adapt to what it is and what you're working on and that's something that's also stressed. Um, people come in and have one goal and you know, right now we're dealing with natural disasters and so an agency may shift focus and your expertise may be in line with that and you may be able to carve out that experience and tie it back to what your initial interest is. So I think you can be specific in what you bring to the table and what you're looking for and what you're hoping to, the skills you're trying to enhance or better understand in relation to the policy issue that you're interested in. But I don't think you need to go into detail about what your day-to-day -day will look like and your five-year plan is exactly this and at two o'clock I'll do this on this day and in 10 years. I don't think you should do that because I think because the issues and the topics and the agendas are, are changing, you have to be um, able to adapt to that. And your background gives you the expertise to come into a situation and be critical in helping to solve whatever issue that agency is looking for. I think uh, both my experiences have been actually relevant to the sort of research I do, um, but that's not the rule in any way, shape, or form. Um, a lot of the congressional fellows are sponsored by professional societies. They tend to be heavy on the astrophysicists and the, uh, the astronomers, and there isn't a whole lot Congress does unless some of those folks did work on, you know, space policy or whatever, but most of them were just working some other portfolio, and they're sharp people who have uh, developed intellectual skills through their PhD that are transferable, even if they're not working on their actual area of expertise, or their what they think of as their area of expertise. Their area of expertise and their skills are broader than they might know right. they are when they come in. So turning to some of the advanced questions that we receive, I think this is a really great one. It's actually kind of looking at um, academic institutions. So if you could advise an academic institution or the faculty or staff, what advice would you give an institution to help their graduate students better prepare for an, an for the SMT Policy Fellowship programs like the SMT Policy Fellowship, or even approaching the application or interview process for the fellowship program. And I know that you both sort of come at this from you know different uh, um, you know relationships with the university, you know um, PW faculty, and then actually with your current role, you do you know, spend a lot of time with the College of Engineering and a number of universities. So, what advice would you give to universities? Or what so coming from, from my own experience, combined with the work that I do, which like I said is with a lot of universities, um, I would think my suggestion would be to be open to this idea of policy in general and find ways to allow your students who are interested or maybe interested to explore it on that level. Um, I graduated from um, graduate school in 2013 and from 2006 to 2013 as I was in graduate school policy was considered this alternative career that met in a small room at research conferences. And I think now it's changed, it's evolved. I don't want to say back in the day when I was in school, but I think universities have gotten a lot more, have, they have a better understanding that this is a viable field and that a lot of PhDs can implement and change and be impactful in policy roles. And so I think having those universities explore that, um, having professors who have done more than just be a professor. So Peter stepped out and He's, he's involved and if he goes back, he brings that experience back to his students and he can help them tie it in. I found a lot of times undergrad, graduate students are not able to tie in those experiences and those interests and there's a disconnect. And so I think universities providing that connection. Um, when I think of STEM, I think of a table with different seats and everyone has a role they can play at that table. And you can sit in several seats and each seat gives you a different viewpoint, a different perspective. So I think academia is important. I think the nonprofit, government, all of those areas help you see how you feed into this pool of research and um, STEM. 
So I think for universities to acknowledge that, which I, I feel like they are, and, and really allow students to explore their interest in policy and what it means would be um, monumental in helping people prepare for fellowships like this. Peter? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to mostly defer to Ashley. It's been a long time since I was in graduate school. <laughs> um, but I think some of the battles are the same. You know, graduate schools are very good at preparing future graduate school professors. Mm -hmm. um, and back in my day, the big sort of battle or sort of uh, discussion was about how much grad school should be preparing people for teaching as opposed to just deep dives into very specific research. And I, I would think about preparing students to be more active in policy as sort of also something that should get probably more attention at grad schools than it does, but it's been a while. So this next question is Maureen Eppin. Um, this question is for you, Ashley. So Maureen is asking, do you ever miss bench science? And how did you weigh the decision to to either go the traditional research scientist route or to go on your current track? So I do miss it a little bit. Um, and the beauty I found going through the fellowship and that the different seats that I mentioned is that I'm able to, to still have a connection to the bench as well. So I'm in a nonprofit role right now, um, but further, further down the line, I do plan to go back to academia, which is interesting because as a graduate student, I was like, I'm not doing that but things come full circle. And so for me, I found ways to still be connected to the bench by doing research and engaging in hands-on research in addition to working the nonprofit non STEM sector that I belong to. So um, another thing the fellowship taught me is carving out your experience. So what, does you, what do you want your career to look like? You have the option to do that. Um, a buzzword around DC is consulting. So a lot of times people will consult in various areas because they have different interests. And I am fortunate to be able to carve out what I want my STEM career to look like. And so a large chunk of that is policy and some of that does have me um, interacting with the bench. Um, not as a primary PI, but I still have a relationship with the bench where I can go back and, and feel that itch per se if I want to hold my bet. <laughs> Right. And I feel like I've only walked away temporarily, so it's, it's not, I know a lot, of, a lot of folks in the fellowship program are considering, you know, completely leaving academia more than, yeah, that's not my situation. So this is an advanced question that we received, and the questioner has an interdisciplinary degree, um, and she is wondering how she should go about choosing a fellowship program area to which to apply. So as we've mentioned, that applicants can apply to executive, judicial, or the legislative branch. So what advice, or, or I guess just generally, what advice would you give to people? Or how did you approach the program areas to which you applied? So there have been some changes a little bit, I think, from, from when I apply in terms of the the agencies and, and what your options are within a certain field. But I would say looking at the description as well as talking to alumni fellows and get an idea of where you are. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be spot on. Right. Um, I think you need to have that background understanding of what each one does and find where your mix of skills would, would fit in or what you want your skill set to be would fit in and go from there. Um, in terms of the areas, you can apply for one area and you may be at an agency that you didn't necessarily think you were going to be at. So I didn't necessarily, I didn't think I was going to be at the Science Foundation because of the track that I was on. I have a chemistry background, biochemistry, so education and diversity was something that was done on a volunteer basis, but my skill set was chemistry and, and this different science. And so I think if you do the background work and talk to some alumni because a lot of people have these interdisciplinary uh, uh, degrees and, and specialties. You can get an idea of where your fit is and then once you're in the fellowship you can carve out again your experience. So the bulk of people are going to be in the executive branch. I mean, right. Looking at the number of fellows that's the overwhelming and I believe in um, that the silos they used to put the executive branch applicants into are kind of getting mushier. So I think it's not a problem to have 
interests that range a little bit more. Um, and honestly, the government isn't about the same silos that the uh, that academics is about. So. So this next question is um, for you, Peter, and it comes from Jamie. And the question is, are there any skills specifically required for doing a fellowship in the legislative branch? Or what skill set would you recommend? So again, I, I've worked in a lot, a lot in the last year to get over my need to uh, have days to consider something and weigh uh, all the evidence as carefully as an academic would in preparing a paper. Uh, so um, that's that's something that I've been developing as a skill. Um, on the Hill, talking is how people communicate. Um, I think in academia, papers and emails are how people communicate. Um, so you need to work on the one-on-one -on -one Someone said, you know, in D.C. you're working, having a beer or a, a coffee with somebody who is, is part of your work day. Um, and, it, you know, in academia, it's what you do because you're not at work, right? Um, so you need to be able to write very well and very concisely and clearly, but much more than in academia, um, you need to be able to converse. So going back to some of our advanced um, questions and looking at the application and specifically the letters of reference, so what advice would you give to someone in terms of who to approach for their three letters of reference? Um, so this person says that all of my references are technical people with no background in policy, so they're concerned about that. So could you speak to that a little bit? I, um... I can't speak for the, the official process in terms of what they're looking for, but um, I know personally my letters of recommendation came from my graduate PI, my postdoc PI, um, and a mentor in the field who I did a, a policy fellowship with, but it was not in line with the same things I was going into the AAAS, the S the AAAS fellowship with. Um, I think a lot of as long as they can speak to your interests and again your story, I think that is is important. Now there may be specific qualifications on where the recommendations may have to come from on a technical level from AAAS, and I can't speak to that. But I think that as long as these people can can attest to your interests, what you've been involved in, why you want to pursue this, what they've observed in you in terms of your working and initiatives and, and how you organize, I think that should be the primary focus. Um, and if oh, I've learned that they have questions, they will definitely ask you on the interview <laughs> about certain things. But um, I think having technical people, a, a professor would probably be good. It gives you different aspects to make you a little more well-rounded. However, I don't, I don't necessarily think that would hinder you by having the technical people. I mean, Here. technical people, probably all you know, um, if you're just coming out of grad school, and there's nothing wrong with that. If, if there's someone that can speak to your ability to teach or otherwise communicate or can speak to, you know, things you've done um, other than be at the bench, um, I think that would be good, but I don't know that it, you have who you have in terms of your, your recommenders. I don't think it's going to hold you back unless they say terrible things. I don't know. So we are almost coming to the end of our time, so I think we have time for just one more um, question. Um, and this question is for you, Ashley, and it's from Nicole. And our question is, what volunteer or leadership work did you do, did you do during graduate school and your postdoc? And then how did you go about finding these opportunities? Graduate school, um, I, I was one of the first few graduate, so graduate students at my um, college who was interested in policy and really trying to pursue it. So a lot of the things just involved me having, a, just walking up someone having a conversation. Um, I was very active in um, volunteer things. I belong to a sorority, so I was very active in their STEM initiatives and, and helping kids and um, undergrads at the time become interested in science. Um, in my postdoc, I started adjuncting, and that for me was really the tie to STEM education. 
as a African American female, I would walk into a classroom and they did not think that I was their teacher. Um, it made for some very interesting conversations, but then it turned into, well, how did you do this? How did you do this and you are 30 or 29? How did you, how did you navigate this? And for me, it became a question of how do I help other people do that as well? And so started to carve out things that way. Um, talking to people, I started mentoring people. I started searching for initiatives in DC at my university that involved the aspect of STEM education that I thought I was interested in. So originally I, I started with K-12 and then I, I realized that I really like undergrad, grad, and faculty level development. Um, so I moved into that. But I would say to find these initiatives, there are a lot of programs that are always looking for um, scientists, graduate postdocs to come in and work with students, whether it's minorities, whether it's just at a high school, um, if you're if you belong to a church, if there are different nonprofits that have volunteer initiatives that are going on, or you can just express your interest to someone and you never know what they know to help you. So that's a major thing. You have to be able to communicate with people what you're interested in doing so that when an opportunity shows up, they can think about you to pull in, to be involved in that. So I would start on campus. Um, I'm sure there are different initiatives on campus. And then I would look to see what organizations you belong to outside of school and see what STEM initiatives they have and how you can incorporate your interests. And even if it's not education, if it's climate, if it's um, women's health. I have a friend that put on health fairs when she was in graduate school. So there, there are different avenues that you can explore that are related to your interests that are outside of the bench. So Peter, I'd actually be curious, sir, to give him your um, a background as faculty, what advice would you give to someone as a faculty member, or what advice would you give to graduate students in terms of trying to seek out some of these leadership opportunities? Graduate students? Um, I think as a faculty member, you get leadership opportunities just within the university. They come to you, take them. Um, but uh, I, I think as a graduate student, you more have to seek them out. Uh, and it sounds like Ashley did, and here she is. So um, I think uh, that maybe says, speak something with an N of one to the value of doing that. Um, but I think that's really something you need to, to seek out early in your career, and they'll just come to you later in your career. Great. So now that brings us to the end of our time together, so I wanted to wrap up by asking both Peter and Ashley to kind of share some parting advice. So for those that are thinking about delving into science policy and then also specifically applying to the AAAS ST policy fellowships, what parting advice would you give to someone? So Ashley, why don't we start with you? I would, I, I would give two pieces of advice. The first one would be to apply. Do not sell yourself short and cancel yourself out before applying. Apply, go through the process, get the feedback, and, and navigate from there. And the, the other piece of advice would be don't let the fellowship be your only involvement with policy. So if you get the fellowship or you don't get the fellowship, you can still have an impact, you can still be involved, you can take another route and, and potentially be sitting here in a conversation with us on the Hill or wherever having that dialogue. So, I think maintaining that interest, feeding your interest, and sustaining it are um, very important in helping you to dig deeper into your science policy career. And then Peter? So for mid-career folks, I would say apply. It's a, it's a great experience. I've had a, I really enjoyed the program. Um, as a scientist, you need to kind of be prepared to check your ego as a scientist at the door. You know, my mid-career science CVs bloat to 10, 20 pages. AAAS makes you cut it down to four, and that feels bad. To actually apply for a congressional job, you need to cut it down to one, and you're not going to put any of your papers on it. It's like having a PhD is good. No one really cares beyond that. Uh, so uh, the PhD is nice, but uh, you're going to have to – start building a reputation different ways. It's, it's, it's not the same way that people are evaluated in, uh, in academia. So. Great. So that brings us to the end of our um, time here together. And I wanted to thank both Peter and Ashley for joining us today and for sure sharing your fellowship experience and policy insight. You guys both provided some great advice. So thank you for that.
I also wanted to thank all of you, our audience, for joining us today and for all of your great questions. If we weren't able to answer your question today, please email us at fellowships at AAAS.org. And then join us on October 12th for an STPF Q&A hour. So this will be a text-based chat and the entire hour will be devoted to your questions as we approach the November 1st application deadline. So if you're getting ready to submit your question or your application, you have last minute questions, are you still wondering about the fellowship um, areas? We'll be here to take your we'll be here to take your questions. You can also find a list of all the on-demand links for previous chats in the series on the Fellowships website. I encourage everyone to take a look at the Fellowships website for more information and details about the application um, process. And thank you everyone for joining us today and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.